I'm planning on doing some stuff with Matterhorn in the next 12 months. And um, on the list, it's quite inaccessible to really understand what, what others are doing. Um, so, you know, recently I've been project planning for, for, for my Matterhorn deployment, and one of, the, one of the big things on my project plan was to make a... Um, an engaged player clone alike in HTML5 because it's de demanded by my institution, but fortunately, someone has done all that work for me, and I certainly owe some, someone a beer. But uh, luckily, I hadn't actually started work myself, otherwise I might have um, put a load of effort in and made something half as good and then had to throw it away at the end. So I thought it might be worthwhile, I think, for the next 45 minutes or so to talk about what we're planning on doing next. Um, I know some people are leaving on the tour, so is there anyone who's going on the tour that wants to talk about their plans first? Or you might have to listen to mine for five minutes. I, I don't know if that's a suitable threat. Um, I think this microphone might be slightly better. Um, so, so, so I guess my plans for the next 12 months is that um, today we're an institution that has one uh, Matterhorn capture agent and a, and a single, uh, you know, all-in-one generic out-of-the-box Matterhorn capture server. Um, we have quite a demand on us after, off the back of a successful pilot to create a, uh, a, a larger scale system. Um, it's subject to financial approval, so everything I say has a little asterisk next to it, um, saying, yes, star, we're intending to do this, but I'm assured that we should have that financial approval on Tuesday next week. So I think the idea is that we're going to spend the next two months testing capture agents of various types to see if they, they meet our institutional needs. Um, shortly after that, we're going to try and deploy 20 uh, lecture capture agents uh, between September and uh, Christmas so that we'll have 20 classrooms much like this that are capable of recording whatever comes out of the projector and whatever's coming out of the main microphone. And then we're going to distribute that to, uh, to a video portal, which we haven't yet created um, or, or decided on. And then that will be able to be viewed on iPads by students. And they'll wholly be able to expect, if they're having lectures in those venues, that uh, their academics can come in and use a system that they don't have to press buttons to operate. And that, you know, Within 24 hours, students are going to see um, lecture capture that they can either download or watch live. Um, if that's successful and you know it meets all our business requirements, which are qu quite a short list, between uh, February 2013 and uh, September the 1st that year, we're, we're going to deploy another 80. So the, the plan is by September 2013, we'll have approximately 100 capture agents in lecture theatres and seminar rooms recording lectures. Um, we have some rough estimates of what we think the usage on this system might be. Uh, so our KPI for success will be approximately uh, 12,000 hours of recorded lectures per year. Um, and we're hoping to get about 1.5 million to 2 million uh, views stroke downloads. Um, that would be about 20% of the content that's being taught in those, uh, in those locations. It's, uh, it's hard to know whether that's a reasonable expe expectation, but basically we've done a rule of thumb where we've got 10 locations now, they get about that amount of traffic, we've counted the number of seats in each location, the average uh, classroom utilization, and simply multiplied it all by 10. Um, in the course of doing this, as I say, I thought we'd have to develop a HTML5 player, but it looks like that's not so necessary. Um, I think one of the main things we're probably going to struggle with, other than the technical side of scaling, is that we need some kind of video portal. Uh, I was very interested to see all the work that MIT had done yesterday, because we need a cohesive area where a student can log in, and they're going to see content that's relevant to them, you know, their last week's lectures, um, and then, then archive material of those units going back, not just a, a random selection of stuff that they then have to search through. Um, so I think some of those are some of the challenges we face in the next 12 months. Um, it might sound impractical, and usually people start calling me crazy at this point, but we have a reasonable amount of resource assigned to it. So um, uh, I intend to manage the project. Uh, we're going to get someone in to do full-time QAing and second-line support, and our intention is to get two full-time developers, uh, which will be permanent posts, and they'll work on nothing but Matterhorn and the associated delivery system uh, all day long. Um, it, it's interesting selling that idea to management, but they seem quite enthusiastic about it because we've had very strong student feedback. Um, and the other thing is, uh, I was saying in the meeting yesterday that we have approximately 30 to 40 different video solutions at our institution. And these are variously video capture systems, video delivery systems, screen capture, lecture capture, all kinds of different stuff. And it costs money to run all those different systems. And because Matterhorn's quite flexible and we can attach it to other um, uh, interoperable components, that we might be able to get that number from 30 to 40 down to, you know, some kind of single digit figure. Um, so those are kind of uh, our goals in the next 12 months. Uh, I'd be interested to hear from anyone else that's planning on doing anything. I think, let me, okay, sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
I should, should probably mention, I don't think I said it already, but I think one of the outputs of the meeting from Oxford last time we did this was about 50 or so requirements. I wasn't really planning on doing anything similar for this. I was just interested in what other people were doing. Um, some of those 50 were completed, some weren't, and I might try and summarize this meeting on the recording afterwards at some, on one of the wiki pages. Uh, sorry, one of the things probably worth mentioning just while you're getting set up. Um, I'm here till tomorrow. I intend to go out after this session. If you'd like to join me in the pub at some point, um, if, it, if it's still sunny outside later on, I'd suggest we meet at, you know, say, 7 o'clock in Charlie's Kitchen. I think that was the place we went on the first night. And if it's chucking it down with rain, I'd probably suggest, I think it was uh, John Harvard's Brew House, uh, which was also quite nice. Right. That's where my students and I go after our capstone course. <laughs> um, I was astonished how much beer it cost to get four big pitchers. Um, but I offered to do that as the first round. So um, we're doing uh, pilots in two stages. This um, summer, we're going to be, uh, we built, we've built a dev environment. Um, Miguel, who's, maybe he's not here right now. He's working on it right now, right, because actually Monday, Tobias is going to be giving us the course. Um, so. We've got a long, we, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, we're up to 80 courses a semester. We have about 5,000 distance students. And unlike most of the other programs uh, that we've heard about, uh, some of our students have access to the course only through video. Uh, they're online students, literally. Uh, it's optional for students who are registered and local to watch the videos or not. So. I'm just going to highlight two or three of the things that we do, and some of the things that we know we have to do, uh, I've already seen here, and, and hopefully we can pick up and learn from those things. But um, we've got a variety of users of our systems, and the most important one, of course, is the viewers. So one of our expectations, if you look at the first item, is that viewers should be able to um, view a publication as long as they have um, thank you. I'll try not to blind anyone. Um, as long as they have audio-only bandwidth. So we have students in remote locations. So in those cases, that's all a student needs to see. We also send along some uh, snapshots of the course uh, desktop. Um, now, in order to achieve high bandwidth, like LAN, so we actually generate three different LAN uh, three different uh, video formats for each publication. And, you know, a better solution would be to have uh, sort of an adaptive streaming thing. By the way, everything we do is streaming. There's no um, progressive download unless an instructor wants to have a podcast for his lectures, right? And there are maybe two instructors out of 80 who want to do that. Um, so the other thing is, in our screen, we need to be able to navigate um, to various places. So it's convenient for a student to get to the videos through their course website, to be able to jump from video back to the course website based on something an instructor has said, and so on. Yes? Uh, I just, as you switch already to the uh, second item, I want to say uh, what you expect from much more than Okay. Yeah, that's actually the way we do it when we start a video, and I'll show you how we do that. Right. So, um, ah, okay. So, uh, I just wanted to say that the, um, Matterhorn is already able to uh, work with audio-only versions, and even if you produce uh, the full two-stream version, there's always an audio version produced, and we currently only missed to add the button or selector to switch to the audio-only version. That's all. So it's uh, 
probably a, would, a day of work to add this. Okay, good. Um, the other thing that's important on this list that I want to mention um, is, of course, you've heard from Jody before that we, we do now have 60% of our courses with live streaming. Um, and at the same time they're live streaming, they're capturing and then can be played back uh, on demand. And um, there's an issue about how students get to things. And I'll just show you quickly, I think. Right now, this is what we do. We, we generate this from the data in our production system. And it shows things organized by week. There is a link at the top that a student can go to the course website. They can come from the course website back to this page. So we call this a publication listing page. Um, it, you can sort it by last week to first week or most recent. And there are a couple of different things in here that we know when you're going to need some add, to add some data about the publication. Every publication uh, is one of three types. It's a lecture, it's a section, or something else. Right? Um, and an instructor has the option of giving us a title for a particular lecture. So this instructor was very careful about that and always did it. It's, in fact, my course. Um, so <laughs> um, the um, different kinds of lectures. So you can see here there's a special one where I actually republished something. I pulled it out of the archive, and I wanted this year's students to see what last year's students had done. Right? So the ability to republish is important to us. Right? And as a matter of fact, this summer we might try to republish something from our existing archive into Matterhorn, which I think will be kind of a cool thing to try. Right? Um, let's see if I can get back to where I was. So what other viewers do we have? Well, we have a bunch of folks we call producers, but their formal title is production specialists. And they're the ones who work with instructors to get the course going. They, they also do production work in the system that we have today. Um, and one of the things we say is the production specialist should be able to choose the formats, that is, the layouts of the screen that are appropriate for the course. And right now, we have four different publication formats. It's either a 16 by 9 video, or it's 4 by 3 video. And then the other option is either they're going to be slides, that is VGA captures, or they're not. We have instructors who write on the board a lot, and all you see is the talking head. So we'd like to be able to do something like that, right? Um, and the second one is that we set in and out points. So my class is two hours. I go in, I basically set an endpoint that skips over the part where I was fumbling around trying to get the software going, um, chop out the middle where there was a break, and then chop it at the end if maybe we ended early. So we need that kind of a feature as a, an edit to do. Um, and then getting on to the production administrators, there's a ton of schedule, scheduling that goes on. And we need to do some work on our own end about that um, in terms of you know, scheduling 80 courses. For each course that we schedule, there are about 60 bits of information that we need to know. Uh, we manage people in the schedule as well as classrooms. Um, and of course, then there's the instructor in the course itself, all that kind of data. Um, so we need some kind of a scheduling tool. Karen has been working on a program to take things from our current scheduling database and feed them into the core schedule. And so the Matterhorn system. We also keep track of our environments. Um, so we know what systems are associated with which classroom, right? So we need to know that. Because we schedule by classroom more than by physical device. And so the very often, the administrators need to be able to swap a device, very often at the last minute. And I asked a question about it, and Rudiger gave a good answer, I think, about how we could approach that. Or actually, it's Chris who talked about that. Um, and then my favorite topic, since I, I play all of these roles, practically, except student, um, the thing about metrics. It's really important. You, you can't scale to the level that we've scaled, where we're doing 250 hours of video a week um, with videographers. Um, we've used over 100 classrooms in the last 10 years. 
we move around a lot. That's another kind of event that takes place is a, uh, at the first two weeks, sometimes people have too many students locally, and so we have to move them to a different room, and that means all the resources we've allocated for handling that course have to get released, and a new set of resources applied. So we need to be able to do that automatically, right? Um, but it's the metrics, you know, down to the level of these operations that we're doing, what's the overhead for each one of those, and how can I improve the overall, I mean, that's the whole purpose of workflow systems. You want to be able to improve your processes by measuring how well you're doing, fix the bottlenecks, and move on to the other stuff, right? Um, so we're very interested in how we're going to pull all of that out, out of the database and out of the uh, information about the uh, media packages, right? So that's kind of an overview of what we're going to try to look at, first of all, in the summer school, where we're not going to make things available to students, but use it as our little laboratory to figure things out. In the fall, we need to have a lot of this stuff in place to actually show it to students. Questions? Stunned? I don't know. <laughs> I was perfectly clear, so there are no questions. That's what I tell my class. Yes. The size of my team. Um, well, we, we've actually got uh, six developers, a QA person and a person who helps uh, with sort of lecture design, if you like. Um, I'm not sure if I caught myself, uh, counted myself there. We've got producers. So, um, there are 25 people overall in our department, which includes the producers. There are several system administrators um, and six developers. The only thing that's difficult about this summer is that while we're trying to get Matterhorn up and running, we're also making some significant, significant feature changes in our current system, so developers are doing a lot of uh, context switches. But they're a confident, happy bunch. I think they'll be all right. Yes. This gap analysis is really useful. I, I, I imagine that you'll be fleshing this out further, actually, as, as you progress yes. further. And, and right. would this be something you could make available to the Matterhorn community? Or? Uh, could we make this available? Um, actually, I gave this to Andy and Tobias last November. I, it's possible we could do it. Now, for those of you that haven't adopted Matterhorn yet, start thinking hard about what you want to do with it and write it down in very specific terms. Because if you don't know what you're doing, any road will get you there, right? Um, so these, these is, this is probably less than a tenth of the user stories we've developed. In fact, I might even be less than a hundredth. Um, this is a short list, but these are the really upfront stuff. And over time, I mean, we've got an archive system, for instance, which has a large number. We've got uh, a very different approach to uh, authentication and authorization using the Harvard ID system. Our, our uh, authorization goes down to the level of a particular lecture, a particular student, and a particular time range. And in fact, it can be a friend of the instructor, right? So we've got lots of rules that, and capabilities in our authorization system that allow us to handle that. So we have doubts that the spring framework is going to be adequate for that level of detail. Yes. Have you picked a capture agent yet? Ah, have we picked a capture agent? <laughs> Well, we've got two in hand, and we're going to just try them this summer. One is the in-cast box. We was uh, supposed to have gotten the latest version of that when Hank was in town. I'm not sure we did. Um, the other is the Gallicaster box that we just received. Um, so we'll start with those. If others become available, we'll try them out too. Um, so this is kind of exactly what I was hoping to get from this session, finding other institutions that were doing stuff like this. Um, we're kind of at the project planning stage. I was wondering if you'd be interested in, in seeing some of our project plans to see if there'd be like shared areas where we we're developing similar resources, uh, you know, in some spirit of cooperation. Okay, that would be fine. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and in light of what Tobias said, I'd, I could post all this and just say, well, has anybody already done this? 
you know, does it look applicable to what we're trying to do here and save us some time, right? Yeah, I would love if you would do that, that kind of thing, because otherwise we, we don't know what's, what's missing from your point of view, but the audio example is, an, is a great one because it has been inside since 1.0. So you can work with audio-only versions, play it back, embed it everywhere. And uh, it has been in since, like I said, since the first versions, but uh, maybe not exposed enough for you so that you're aware of that. Like uh, also what Chris uh, from, 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 from London mentioned yesterday, all the newbie stories that you're, um, or the newbie problems you run into are really good information that we need to collect in our wiki sites so that other people can, can come on board. But again, this uh, gap analysis is really ex perfect because otherwise we don't know where to spend resources or to, 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 to um, prioritize right. So that we need to uh, exactly know which are the important parts we need to spend resources or time on. Right. Yeah, yeah well, that's always the choice, right? Yes. Um, thanks. For you and also for Stuart, I'm wondering how much of the development you intend to do inside Matter Matterhorn as opposed to outside Matterhorn, which might be difficult to answer, but you know, there's a let's build it to make it work for us versus let's do a longer term thing that gets it into the core code base, et cetera. And well, works. actually, I, I think we're pretty um, interested in the idea of having contributors on our team and really getting embedded. But I mean, we're still at the stage where, you know, we got to get through the summer pilot first. While we're doing the summer pilot, we're making plans for the fall pilot. The, the, you know, there might be a point where we just say, well, this isn't going to work out for us. I, I want to point out that there's another group at Harvard. Um, so I'm part of Harvard DCE. There's sort of the big Harvard with the Harvard University IT department. Doug Hall is here. And they're looking at it, and uh, of course, Phil. And they're looking at um, sort of a video capture engine for anybody at Harvard, right? And that's a different kind of a project with a different set of use cases and user stories, right? And we haven't even figured out how we would mesh with that yet. But perhaps we'll get into a situation where we don't have any classrooms that we do lectures in um, that aren't equipped with some kind of a capture agent, which would be nice for us. Yes. So, uh, and I will add, and we don't have any plans yet. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not part of any of the video uh, team, but the annotation uh, part of the video uh, players is something that we will be looking at carefully. And if, if uh, Opencast Matterhorn is one of the platforms that we'll be using for our lecture videos, we'll probably start uh, initiating conversations on how we implement um, annotations within that system. And I think same goes for DCE for, for some of the joint courses that we'll be teaching. So I guess there'll be some higher level conversations about where that goes. But nothing yet in the, in the works. Right. It's nice to come to a conference and find out what other people in your own university are doing, right? <laughs> Oh, oh, my goodness, that's not fair. <laughs> Actually, it's um, related to the project in the summer, but also to the tools that Tobias mentioned on your site, The because um, you have the, for example, the Greenhopper um, project management tool that's built in with the JIRA and SVN and the Matterhorn and whatnot. Is that really, that's open for, for groups to check it out and and use that? Or, and would so would that be open to the OpenCast community, or could we... Would it be fair for us to add restrictions to if we use something like that? Um, I'm not completely sure I understand the question. Can you can you be using the tools yeah. as Harvard? Yeah. Yes. the the only the only um, restriction or obligation uh, that comes with it is that you do that you have your code located um, in an MSAP, you know, which means the code would be visible to others and can also be taken by others. And reuse, so it's a matter of licensing. Um. I, okay, just one more thing. Did I mention mobile? <laughs> okay, I just wanted to hit that nail one more time. Right. So, 
Chris is next. I think I was the only person to come up and present using Windows. <laughs> is that Windows? Oh, it looks like a Mac. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the right one. Well, us, us Windows guys, us 1% have to, uh, I guess, represent here. So um, uh, I'll be quick. Uh, this summer, we're increasing our 11 rooms to 20 rooms. And the next summer, we're doubling that again to 40 rooms. Um, one of the big changes for us this summer is that we're uh, all of our new rooms, we want to be on a vended capture agent solution, so we're evaluating uh, two different capture agents right now, the Epifan MCD, I think, uh, is what it's named right now, and the NCAST agent uh, that, that Hank gave us to evaluate. So we're evalu doing those evaluations right now. Um, one of the other issues, and, and, and maybe I'll... I'll, I'll address this too, is mobile, uh, and that's to determine our mobile strategy. Um, I don't know what we're going to do for mobile, but I know there's huge interest inside of our institution for mobile, so over the next 12 months, I'm hoping that we'll come to some consensus as to whether we want something app-driven, and if so, if we have to make changes to Matterhorn to go, or what we want to do with that. I was very impressed with the dual stream playback, for instance, on Matterhorn to go is quite nice. Uh, so whether we do that or whether we try and do an HTML5 thing, this is something um, we're going to be very interested in to hear what other people are doing. Um, my guess is, though, that we'll try and build off of Osnabrück's uh, success with Matterhorn to go. Um, we're also adding some general statistics, um, and this is, we kind of, I, I think I showed, some, or uh, Adam showed some of these early prototypes at the last conference, unconference, and now they're halfway implemented, and we've made some small design changes. The idea here is to give instructors access uh, to information um, about their lectures and uh, how much they've been watched. So this one, for instance, just shows a bunch of lectures here, uh, how many times they've been watched and uh, how many minutes they've been watched, and it's just kind of bubbles up the most popular lectures. Nothing very fancy, right? Um, this one's a, a little more fancy. You can set a, a, a date uh, and time range, so September 1st, October 23, uh, sorry, October 23rd, and uh, uh, see different accesses over time um, uh, by your different lectures that you have access to. So if you're teaching multiple lectures, uh, th this could change, uh, or multiple videos as well. Um, so you can see, oh, people are watching that first video in the first week, but then they never come back to it, or they rewatch all of the videos again at the midterm. Um, so that one is mostly done, right? I think the uh, the the deployment for that. I'll skip that one. Um, we have the uh, CSV version, <laughs> one giant ass table of all your data that you can export to CSV. So it's not much of a visualization, but I think it's useful for uh, some instructors. And then this last one is a, a tree map. Um, basically, the size each box uh, refers to a department. Um, and uh, the size of the box refers to how many uh, lectures have been watched in that department or maybe total number of minutes. Uh, then you can click on that box and it, and it redoes the tree map and shows you all of the different courses inside of that department. Then you can click on a course and it shows you inside of that all of the different sections or all of the different students. So in this example, computer science and chemistry are the heavy hitters with lots of viewership and so forth. And uh, I'm hoping that this will help us make strategic directions about or decisions about directions we want to take, lecture capture on campus, which uh, uh, facilities we want to outfit and which faculties we want to engage with. So these are simple things. They all use the data collection mechanisms that have been in 1.3. Maybe even most of them use the data collection mechanisms from 1.2, actually. And um, we, the bundle wasn't finished for 1.4, so it'll be in uh, 1.5, but it's uh, mostly done at this point. Uh, that's the bundle for the, the visualizations. The data collection, of course, is already in there. 
just a bit of a technical question. Does this also involve extensions of the way you can query the REST endpoints for user tracking? Yes. Because, okay. Because we need to, because we do, it's one of the things we've been looking at is oh. for our LTI use cases, we want to be able to find, for instance, the most popular videos in a series. Perfect, you yeah. Know, which the data's there, but there's no way to get at it at the moment. Yeah, so I'd be talk, to, talk to Adam. Adam's the one who's been doing all the rest uh, stuff. We've got another developer, Colleen Hansen, who's been doing most of the UI work. Uh, but yeah, please. Uh, so it sounds like we're both evaluating capture agents over the summer. Uh, I'd be quite keen to coordinate that with you because um, th th there's more out there than I would have expected. Um, uh, it will save waste time and probably money if we if we share information. I realize that our criteria might be slightly different because uh, I know that we're going for um, the PowerPoint only, uh, which uh, and m many people are interested in the video. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're quite curious about thermal data, usability, that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, when particularly, we... particularly failure rates and reliability. Yeah, when we were building the reference implementation, our plan was actually to build a enclosure for it and to heat it up to a certain amount actually and then measure the thermal of various components in it uh, to get an idea because we know our cabinets our AV cabinets are like this and they're packed with racks of stuff that generates heat and uh, so it's a, you know a huge issue for us as well um, and we haven't had a bad experience with our our reference implementation it's even an appropriate size the problem is there's just a lot of man hours to build the system and and maintain it uh, one of the benefits it has versus vended solutions that I've seen so far is that it stores everything on, on the drive uh, as a backup and then just cycles that. And so we just put a 500 gig drive in. So we've got all of our last terms of lectures on the capture agents as well as on the ingested machine. I'm not sure what would happen if we filled up uh, the SD card on, on various um, other ones. So I'm uh, happy to share whatever data we collect. And, uh, yeah, and happy to share our purchasing decision uh, uh, when we make it. Chris, I'm really interested that you say it takes a long time to build a capture agent. Why not just script a complete install, which does the Ubuntu and the entire thing? And no, I actually mean screwing a motherboard in, putting a CPU in, putting a. So when we when we build it that way, it's just a lot of uh, a lot of hours that we would prefer not to spend. So you build a complete box. You don't buy the Dell small form factor. No, we, we, we buy components and, and put them together from that. We've certainly uh, looked at the Dells, and we were interested in UCT's uh, work because they use kind of off-the-shelf Dells uh, uh, for it. Yeah, and, and I, was, I thought that was uh, uh, very interesting. Um, one of the, it, it's tough because one of the things with having created and tested in, uh, the capture agent code is we want to make sure that we discover any bugs in this reference implementation. And so we've tried to be very good about sticking to that. Um, but um, I guess another, another challenge for us as we do these tiered rollouts is that as we've seen from this conference, capture agent prices can change, uh, quality can change, features can change, and I'm not sure what that means. So if we buy, we've got 10 of our custom boxes this year, let's say we buy 10 Epifans this year, next year we buy 20 NCAST machines, the year after we buy 43 Three to three link machines. I mean, what 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 are we getting ourselves into uh, as far as that goes? Um, and so uh, that's a challenge for us, and uh, we're happy to uh, talk to others to see how they uh, do it. Every time we change to you know an agent vendor, I'd hate to have to rebuild all of our classrooms. Um, and at the same time, uh, our tech guys, you know, the intricacies of each system might be uh, quite a bit different when it comes to tweaking audio settings. So. Um, so one decision that we have to make early on, I'd be curious whether anyone has had to consider this. Um, some of our rooms have uh, difficult AV solutions. Some of them are great, and they have big booths like that at the back, and you could put you know, an X number of rack-mounted servers in them. Some of them have lecterns way smaller than that, and they're already full of equipment. So we either have to go for uh, physically quite a small form factor solution, which uh, kind of limits your choices, or the alternative is forwarding the VGA and audio stroke DVI and audio mm -hmm. feed over Ethernet, and then having a centralized capture location. Uh, infrastructurally, that has some advantages because they're all together, you know, in a group of racks, and then you can just pull one out or have, you know, uh, warm spares. Um, but equally, it means a lot of direct one-to-one -one Ethernet links. So I was just wondering if that's something called, uh, that you or anyone else has considered. 
We had definitely had that uh, early on as a consideration in the project about whether we wanted to build uh, to support that. And also there's this Panopto model where you have, it's all software driven. And I think Rudiger, your, your uh, institution, you guys did stuff with um, uh, VNC and recording through VNC um, way back before before Matterhorn. So we we, we had discussed a number of things. Um, one of the one of the principal folks in inside of Matterhorn had questions about network outages and they were really concerned about this. And so this is one of the reasons we went with the box in the room. But certainly you could uh, transform and send it over Ethernet and uh, and do it with a box somewhere else. I'm actually surprised none of the vendors, Hank, dear, are you listening? <laughs> none of the vendors have come out with a VESA mount box. Um, it's not popular because then people can screw with the inputs, but um, when it's on a podium that's a very nice thin podium that has no room, more room for equipment, uh, I thought a, a VESA mount kit so that you could just put it between the monitor and the stand uh, would be interesting. Um, we also marry things with our symposium systems, and I'm, uh, I've been a little bit surprised that they haven't picked up and gone that way to kind of just do the recording, especially for the people who just want VGA and audio. Uh, you've got most of the guts right there already. All you have to do is add the audio feed. So I think, yeah, there's some novel solutions. Uh, carts as well. I don't know how many are doing carts. Well, I know Rudiger's doing carts. We have lots of pictures of Back in the day, Rudiger with carts. Um, <laughs> I don't know that Rudiger wants to do carts. But uh, we have a couple of situations where we need to roll in AV carts. And that's where we see uh, vended solutions really shining. And so finding the appropriate answer for that is, is on our, our to-do list. I, um, with regards to centralized solutions, I designed a solution for Stanford um, about three years ago or four years and was launched about, I think, a year ago now. Um, so if anyone's interested, it's a large scale to capture about, or we're capturing, or still are, about a petabyte of data a quarter. Um, pretty much every event that happens in the School of Medicine was recorded. Everything was centralized over fiber. So the capture agents actually sat in a closet. There was 100 channels um, all transported over fiber and um, converted on a, a centralized a HPC um, set of nodes. So we could discuss, or if anyone else is interested, I have all the um, designs and CAD work that was done to, for the design. So. And uh, I'm, I may add that uh, a long time ago, <laughs> uh, we um, created a patch to cre uh, record RTP streams. We have not finished it in a way because we don't use it currently. I know that UCT is working with this quite well. It's not in the official release yet, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> David uh, <laughs> wanted to write some tests so that it could get in. Uh, so that would be one way to get more or less any device that does RTP streams to the network <laughs> recorded. And uh, for the VNC stuff, uh, what I would not repeat again because yeah. VNC is very, um, yeah, it's not stable to record it. But uh, we are will come up with uh, a two-sided software solution based on a Windows recorder. You can simply write uh, as many streams to the disk as you want from Windows Media devices which may even be a software solution grabbing your screen, but uh, we have not tried that yet. And the second part of this would be a simple remote inbox, what we call it. So uh, software watching directories on your machine, uh, whatever on video, as video files is in these, uh, will be um, submitted to the Matterhorn core. Um, on this way, you can use, for example, Camtasia to easily get uh, material into Matterhorn without deeper knowledge of the system, without uh, the ingest UI or whatever. So you would create a directory structure for series, and uh, the next directory level would be a single um, event episode that you put, want to put there. Okay, so I'll, I'll give a quick overview over um, at least over those. I know it's it's black. It's black. It's a special. Anyway, let's forget about that. Um, a quick overview over what um, we're doing within this year, um, mostly for for customers. Um, I, 
we can't, of course, mention everything, but um, a few of them we can. So first of all, there's Ininet. Um, Ininet is the Norwegian Enron. I um, hope this term is familiar over here as well. Thank you, Olaf. <laughs> so Ininet um, um, was, is looking to, to provide a centralized solution, a centralized Matterhorn installation for um, a var variety of Norwegian um, universities. Um, we're basically what we're doing there is we're, we're doing a large scale installation and they are very, very interested in, in the things you were mentioning, Bill, um, which is uh, metrics and being able to manage large scale installations, which is you know, not yet possible with Matterhorn. We're in the infantile stages, I think. So we'll, we're allowed to do quite a bit of development um, as part of this contract, um, mo most of that will go into um, getting JMX um, statistics up and running and um, building out um, operations infrastructure. This means, you know, connecting all kind of tools to the various Matterhorn um, backend pieces. Next is Stanford University. Um, we are running a pilot over there for almost half a year, a little more, I think. Um, we built an HTML5 player, a very simple version of that um, for that um, for that contract. And right now we're working on, on uh, rights management through LTI. So what they're looking for is um, having the ability for instructors to being the first to view a video, you know, to, to review a recording that has come in and then press a button and say, yes, this is actually, I want this to go live um, or I, you know, I want, I want to um, close it down again. And the next important part is video security. They are the first customers so far uh, looking into uh, securing the actual video streams uh, coming from streaming servers and download servers. Um, so that will be a challenging part of this project. Next on list, I should have put them first, I think, um, is ETH Zurich. Um, Olaf already talked about their endeavor or our endeavor, I have to say, um, connecting Matterhorn to, to CQ5, Adobe CQ5, the content management system. Um, it seems like we're, we're doing this using OAI PMH for now. Um, as part of this project, we're um, building out the archive. We're finalizing the work um, on the archive uh, component that we started months ago, I think. Um, the administrative user interfaces will be redone for ETH Zurich. They have very, very specific uh, requirements and they know exactly what they need. They have years of experience writing these. And um, we found we should probably be taking a completely new approach with the admin UIs. There can be, as the admin UIs are only talking, only quote unquote, talking to the rest endpoints, um, there can be multiple admin UIs. We're not looking to, to disrupt anything, but we're certainly trying to, uh, trying another approach and we'll see. You know, we'll, throw them at the wall and see what, what sticks. And last but not least, there's a structured annotations project. And I think here I'll just pass the mic on to Olaf. He's better talking about this. Well, uh, maybe I should clarify that uh, this structural annotation project is not what you would expect uh, as a video annotation. So video annotation, in, in my uh, sense, basically means that students are able to comment upon a video and then maybe even search these annotations. Uh, in order to to help uh, hotspots within the video, so crowdsourcing kind of thing, uh, maybe enhancements with uh, a judgment upon the video or anything like that. But what we are doing there is that uh, we have uh, sort of scientists that want to do video annotations in a scientific kind of way. So they have they have sets of of annotation um, groups um, with individual uh, variables in there and then the kind of Likert scale strength of that individual variable. So it's all about, um, uh, in, a, in a medical environment, for example, uh, you record a video of a person talking to a, a cancer patient, and then other um, people in the, in the medical studies will look into that video and comment upon how well that particular interview went. And then they have to structure the, the video into different parts, and then they have to use these categories and so on. That's a, what we call structural annotation. So it's a different approach than what you basically will have heard about annotations in general. Um, I would like to add two things to the list, um, because I think that they um, weren't mentioned here. Um, 
how somehow they might be of, of interest to others uh, nevertheless. One is that we have that new um, CMS, uh, CQ5, and with that comes a number of templates that we have to serve uh, with video. So basically, um, corporate communications tells us this is your new CMS and this is where you have to place the video and this is the kind of resolution that you will have for this. And what we have to do is to provide these videos in HTML. And basically, um, we are now at a stage where we think that we will have to prove, uh, produce around about a dozen formats in order to deliver on that um, in the different browsers across the operating systems and across the mobile devices, which are only iOS in our case. So that's a dozen that we already have. And what we are doing, or what we're not doing ourselves, is that we have an external expert in FFmpeg doing uh, a set of encoding schemes for these. Uh, we're not yet uh, at the stage of releasing this, but as soon as we got these, we'll make them available to the community. So if these are something that might come handy for you in sort of going ahead with your uh, distribution towards the different ends, then uh, that should be ready there. The other thing I would like to mention and has been mentioned shortly is the trimming, uh, because we are uh, looking, for, uh, looking forward to a cooperation with uh, Osnabrück over the summer, and we would like to enhance the existing uh, trimming functionality, uh, also with respect to cutting out pauses within the, um, within the lecture recording. We would like to add some, some other features. For example, we would like this to become a destructive trimming, so it really changes the original file, which then also goes into the archive in that uh, changed format. Um, we would also like to do something which is called um, zero crossing uh, editing. Uh, personally, I, I wouldn't know what it is. It basically means that you have to find a point in time in the, in the audio track where the, where the uh, line is sort of at the zero level in order for not to have cracking noises when you edit the material. Uh, I'm sure that sounds terrible for any expert, but that's the, the feature we want to introduce as well, and looking forward to, to doing that with uh, Osnabrück. Hello. The, the comment I want to make is about the structured annotation. Um, the environment of annotation uh, is not limited to just commentaries from students, but uh, of, uh, an annotation framework and um, interoperable framework can take in any form of structural annotation. What you're mentioning is is being able to subclass an annotation so that later on you can actually do some analysis on these tagged annotations, right? And um, I would suggest that, that uh, you look into the open annotation formats so that these, and whatever work that you're doing, maybe is in conjunction with, with other folks, because I think that we would be tackling the same issues and not having to reinvent the wheel. So, I mean, I miss is probably very specific that you're looking for. That's, that's the problem, basically. I, I wouldn't have any money in this project to do so, because it's a, it's a kind of customer relationship that we have there. So they have very specific demands. What they basically do is that we, at the end of the day, export the annotations to uh, SPSS or something, or C CSV as well. Uh, and then they can do the um, analysis of that in a scientific way externally. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that they are not looking into the kind of open uh, connectivity that you were mentioning. Well, I, I think you will want to sort of look into what, what is going to be happening in the arena of, of annot annotating cross-referencing annotations, because there's a lot of work doing um, annotations of scientific papers with ontological annotations, and they're actually cross-linking to different resources. So eventually, you could look at an export format that's interoperable that then could be consumed by other clients. OK, thanks. OK, so the last project we're working on is this. Um, and Twine's goal is to get 1.4 out um, as soon as possible. Most of the projects we've talked um, in here rely on 1.4, on you know one of the features in there. So it's an absolute must for us. Um, also, we're um, we're putting 5% of each contract, um, using that for general bug fixes and whatever may come up during project work. So this is all going towards the community, and uh, we're of course putting in our at least our 20%. 
um, towards general, I, you know, I can't name any features, but you know, there's a list of bugs that is open. That's it. Questions? Next one. Okay, great, if there's someone else that wants to present as well. Present. about uh, our local deployments. Maybe I was uh, too uh, quick after, uh, before, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, our idea is more or less what I already uh, explained. So um, that uh, is, that's focused um, on University of Vigo. And our plans, um, for developing new features um, are very much focused currently in our um, collaboration with uh, also with the University uh, Polytechnic University of Valencia um, trying to um, yeah to take advantage of this um, junk team that we had built together uh, for sure, we are uh, as, uh, as soon as we end uh, or we are ending uh, the final uh, jobs related with the HTML5 uh, player um, for the deployment of the bundles, we will start uh, working, adapting uh, another HTML5 interface or a tool that they uh, had already done during the last. Uh, Maybe two years, Carlos, you have been working in, in your HTML, local HTML5 tools. They have a very compelling um, trimming, user inter, trimming, trimming uh, UI based on, on the um, full Paella player. And we will be adapting it for what we call soft trimming or non destructive trimming. Uh, the idea is to be able to build uh, virtual virtual clips um, or playlists or videos based on on EDLs or or playlists, um, but um, maybe we will rely on functionalities of the HTML5 player uh, reading those playlists. So we will try to to do our best to uh, to be. Uh, compatible as, as as much as possible with the rest of of uh, Motherhorn tools, but um, let's see what we can do. Our professors are asking us for uh, the capability to trim them their, themselves uh, their videos. They they want to be able to to remove parts. Uh, in 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 we we. Um, we explain them that we are not able, we, we um, don't have enough um, labor capacity to do it by, by ourselves in, in our um, central service, but they, uh, they are willing to, to collaborate doing um, that by themselves. So we are planning to, um, to be able to, to somehow give some authorization and Authentication capabilities to the user interface accessing to the trimming, the soft non destructive trimming tool. Also, we are working as Teltec uh, with two customers in Spain that are interested in different implementations of uh, integration with WordPress. One of them is interested in uh, an OIE integration based. Uh, with WordPress, and another one, a, a bigger integration based on, on the development of a plugin for Pumukit plus Motherhorn uh, to be able to, to easily uh, create uh, uh, websites, basic, video based web websites using WordPress. Uh, also, we are currently working and we will continue doing so uh, on the um, 
internationalization and, and improvement of the OCR, and specifically in the Spanish uh, dictionary. Also related with this, our professors are, are also, uh, professors in Vigo are asking us for, um, for a tool uh, also to edit themselves the outcomes of the OCR. They are realizing that the OCR um, is uh, failing, recognizing um, very specific keywords on their presentations, maybe because the, the, um, the base weight of that words on the dictionary is uh, very low, and the OCR tends to, to kill those words, and they want to put uh, themselves that specific words in that specific uh, parts of the text. Uh, because that for sure will improve um, dramatically the, 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 the usability of the, of the search engine. Um, we will, uh, yeah, we will um, base our uh, mobile and, and iPad um, adaptation, adaptation on, on this side-by-side -side approach of gluing together the two videos and, and going to a one stream uh, solution at least just to be able to, to offer uh, at least some experience uh, from, from iPad and, and from uh, Android devices. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, authentication and, to, and authorization based on the capture agents. Um, we have two universities too that uh, want, uh, they don't want to, to do nothing about scheduling and whatever. They want um, to give uh, infrastructure on the rooms. And I like it a lot, the presentation of the guy from 323, I guess. The idea of, of the USB uh, keys uh, to start recording. They want to give uh, the professors the infrastructure, but, but they don't want to do nothing. They want to, be, to, to offer the, the professors the uh, capability to start to stop recording, and then um, deploy the recording to one personal or personal um, repository so they can trim and, and do everything by, by themselves. Uh, yeah, we are currently working too on a solution for live streaming based on, on the Gallicaster device, but um, avoiding the problems of two uh, streams at a time for live streaming, we will just go again to side by side, layout and, and stream. Um, and uh, last thing is the automatization, or yeah, to, to go for an automatic uh, way to record uh, video conferences, uh, traditional video conference based on H323. Uh, this will be a hardware based, -based solution, is uh, what I saw what I, I show you um, before. Um, it's based on, on, now we are doing this manually, um, mainly based on, 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 yeah, on assistant students, um, but we will try to find a way to remote control the uh, um, video conference device and also well, uh, with the Matterhorn agenda and try to synchronize uh, that because for the next uh, academic year we will have to record a lot of lectures uh, remotely uh, using uh, this central video conference recording device based on on, uh, on Matterhorn. And that's that's it. I have a quick question. Uh, so, so soft trimming in HTML5 is pretty high up our priority list. Uh, it's something that academics want. But usually when it comes to trimming, they're kind of thinking more along the lines of very low level editing where they don't just want an in and in an out point. They want to go a little bit beyond that. I was wondering, is that something that you're planning within your development path? You know, collapsing a, uh, a full length video from maybe six in and out points? Um, I don't know if I understand your question correctly. What we are trying to do is, uh, on one hand, being able to to trim like now, but mm, softly or not destruct destructively. And uh, on the other hand, we will uh, we want to uh, to give uh, our staff or our professors the ability to to select what is in 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 fact trimming, uh, cut a big part. 
uh, on the tail and a big part on the head of a video, like select one part. And using, using this small piece, they can then uh, build a, a virtual clip, that's that piece. And also, they can build an empty uh, virtual clip with nothing inside, where they can place, uh, maybe with a, with a drag and drop interface, those pieces, and just build a playlist. So uh, that, that, that does sound very similar to what, what, what yeah. we're after within the next 12 months. And, yeah, and that playlist, you, we, we will be able to fit that playlist to the HTML5 player, and it will start stop playing uh, that specific media in that point, and it will start in, uh, end in that point, and maybe to, uh, to merge together, uh, to avoid some delay, maybe we can um, go to a, a kind of transition between the videos, uh, fading in and fading out. It's, uh, well, we were exploring. I'm, I'm curious whether you think that this might be related to the project that uh, Greg was proposing uh, in Oxford. To me, this sounds very similar in that he was talking about clips also that would be collected. Maybe Adam can speak to it a, a bit more because I don't know more than that it is a clip feature. Would you have it? Yeah, it was supposed to be a feature where. Um, students or instructors could choose sections of clips and then have them played in the Matterhorn player back to back without uh, affecting the original clips. So um, it was in Flash, I think, though, not HTML5. So I don't know if that's a complete duplication or not. The, the question is where, where the focus is, whether it's uh, AA here or HTML5 or whether we're talking about the mere feature, but just not to repeat efforts uh, in, in that domain. Um, what I simply would suggest that there are several approaches to trimming or advanced trimming and uh, video clip editing. Uh, we should at least in the next days, I would even say, uh, make sure that we build a small task for setting a standard on how this playlist, as you called it, uh, should be uh, designed so that we all at least design for the same standard and make it uh, sure that um, yeah, clip lists or whatever clip show lists are exchangeable between these different implementations so that you can, if you once uh, created a clip show from Greg's tool, use it, for example, uh, to compile a destructive uh, created clip too, so that you simply say, this is my uh, stuff and what um, probably Waldemar will build for GStreamer then yeah. can read this and create a new um, file where really this uh, yeah, stuff is yeah. recombined um, and edited. Yeah. And, yeah. So maybe, maybe agreeing on this playlist um, format and placing that playlist on, on a media package, it could be played, that, that media package could be played non-destructively by the HTML5 player and even could be um, uh, destructively composed by uh, an operation uh, really building uh, the clip if you want. Yeah, uh, as I said, we see that we have uh, some, let's say, competitive uh, uh, <laughs> collaborative <laughs> col um, approaches here. And uh, what I simply would suggest is make uh, settle down on standards which we will mm -hmm. follow, so that um, we at least benefit in a way from the work from e of each other. Yeah, in, in my opinion, that's really one of the, or, or the biggest achievement of, of Matterhorn project, establishing these IPIs, these, these uh, common points, where we can develop um, maybe one or two or three solutions for the same uh, task, but everything can interoperate and, and yeah, we can share. I had one more question related oh, to your stuff. Sorry. Uh, oh, it's something that we're doing. Um, so uh, you're saying within the next few days we should set up some kind of task force talking about this. It, it occurred to me that in the next 30 days, I think, uh, we're, um, we have 100 academics that have done lecture capture using our current system, which is not Matterhorn. It's incredibly limited, and many of them asked for the facility to trim or edit. I was wondering if there'd be... Uh, so I have to compose a questionnaire. I'm trying to keep it as short as possible. Um, it will mainly be focused on our institutional leads, but perhaps I could circulate it on the list and then see if there was anything you would like to ask our 100 academics. Um, they all will have experienced lecture capture and been, ha have actively distributed these uh, lecture capture recordings to their students. Um, so if there's 
any questions you'd like to add, as long as it doesn't make my survey too, uh, too lengthy, I'd be happy for people to include other information on it. Yeah, just to, <clears throat> to extend on this, I think there are at least two pieces here, right? One is the code in the FFmpeg or GStreamer things that actually does the editing or the stitching together of smaller clips and playback. And then the other is giving s professors or production folks in a UI where they can actually do this editing. Those are two different projects and that are both needed. So anyway. Yeah. Um, maybe, um, I don't know if it's in the next week, but in the next uh, maybe a couple of weeks, we can be able to to show some uh, mock-up of, of this uh, trimming interface, maybe not working. And uh, yeah, with this non-destructive approach, is everything is, is, is easier. You don't have to deal with uh, media. Uh, in fact, it's just uh, placing um, like vectors, points, uh, and it's, uh, I guess we can go uh, very straight forward uh, with, with this, I, I, it's fair to say that it will be maybe very based on, on this layer on, on Matterhorn, the, uh, the, this um, um, uh, content management system layer or the player layer. Uh. Okay. Thank you, Vicente. I don't want to take over your session, so the question would be whether there are other institutions or individuals that would like to tell us something they are planning within the next 12 months, um, which obviously is not the case. Um, well, so, Rüdiger, <laughs> no session without your participation. I, I'd just like to say, does, does anyone, even if they're you know, thinking of doing a single lecture capture deployment and they have some ideas about what they want to say, it's quite useful knowing those people that are just starting out because you know, that's kind of where we are now. And even if you have a small deployment, you know, I'd be interested to hear about it. So um, I guess most of our plans I have already in a way announced. So um, there is um, the uh, destructive trimming that we discuss with ETH currently. Uh, there's this Windows capture solution with a remote inbox. Um, there is uh, annotations where we will continue to work on, and I'm really uh, thankful for um, uh, pointing us to the standards which we might uh, really consider to uh, implement at first before we continue with anything else there. Um, and for us, especially for annotations, we will have a look at usability currently at this is what concerns us more, most for a student version of annotating videos there. Um, we will do maintaining the engage player, which is uh, whatever features come up next and whichever uh, technology needs adoption there. Same with the capture agent, where we want to make sure that uh, we get a compatibility with Ubuntu 12.4 um, more or less as soon as possible. Um, uh, and one project was missing. Um, notations. Um, a mobile app. Uh, we will continue, as I told in my uh, lightning talk about this already. I guess the main enhancement we are currently looking for is uh, caching, so that you can really view offline with your mobile device uh, what you previously cached there. Um, and probably, as I see it here, um, authentication for this device, uh, for mobile devices, may be something everybody is looking for too. Um, yeah, so um, and skinning for the players, I would say, a player and admin UI, so uh, based especially on series or tenant uh, will be something that we want to introduce in an upcoming release. Thank you, Rüdiger. And I want to shortly pass on to Markus, who can take 